and and read the um, the nonpartisan policy of the league. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization which encourages informed and active participation of citizens in government and influences public policy through education, education and advocacy. The League acts in support of or opposition to selected government issues which its members have studied. It does not support or oppose candidates, factions, or political parties. League members as individuals are urged to work in the political party of their choice. The, vote, the League of Women Voters of Pullman is fully committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion in principle and in practice. These concepts are central to our current and future successes in engaging individuals households, communities, and policymakers in creating a more perfect democracy. We acknowledge and honor the first people of the Palouse region and their descendants, including our neighbors, the Nez Perce, Colville, and Coeur d'Alene tribes. Thank you for coming today. And I will let um, Nils take over. Thank you very much. Thanks, Paul. Thanks so much for uh, getting me connected to the Pullman League. Uh, and I'm glad to be here and be able to talk with you for a little while. I want to start by recognizing your councilwoman, Megan Guido. She has been on a multi-year quest to advance the conversations in Pullman about affordable housing, uh, broadly defined. And I think that may be coming to another stage of fruition this summer as the new council and mayor are doing their strategic planning. It, you may get um, a housing commission of some sort that reports to the council, which would be kind of in parallel to the fair and affordable housing commission that Moscow has uh, that advises our council. Uh, I'll try to remember my Pullman roots. Some of you will remember that I worked at WSU and before that I grew up in Pullman, uh, but now I'm a Moscovite and tend to look at things through that lens a little bit. <clears throat> but a part of the reason for this conversation today um, is that the group that Megan is working with, her housing work group or whatever current sort of ad hoc title it has, has invited um, Moscow Affordable Housing Trust uh, to consider expanding its operations across the state line into Pullman and Whitman County. And a key part of that conversation is that we wanna get to know the community and the community to know us and feel like this is a, an endeavor that is uh, welcomed on both sides. So it's in that regard that I'm here today. And it's in that regard that I offer, if you have another community group, after you've heard this chat and you'd like to invite me to come and do something for that group, uh, please reach out and let me know and we'll see if we can't work something out. Um, if I can figure out the technology here, I'm going to share my screen. Um, before I go, Paul, how long should I try to make this um, or not make this go, <laughs> as the case may be. Well, we have a deadline of one o'clock, and um, usually there's plenty of time for uh, questions, and um, either from you to us or from our members to you. Okay. Uh, and we can do that however you, you like. You can invite invit uh, questions as we go, or we can do them at the end, uh, or we can pre present them in the chat. Um, how about this? If folks are comfortable poking something into the chat, I know it's kind of hard to interact. I have a hard time looking at the chat window and this and that. And um, I'd love well, to have questions and maybe we have a way of collecting them a little bit and having them. Sure. Be. Well, I, I will keep track of the chat and uh, read them out when the time comes so you don't have to fool around looking at the Great. chat. 
Thanks a million. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna switch and share my screen. If I can figure out which screen I'm sharing. There. That looks good. All right, great. Um, so yeah. I am the executive director for Moscow Affordable Housing Trust. Whoops. Is it still sharing? I just switched. Oh, windows. It, it jumped back. It jumped back. Okay. My bad. Yeah. There we go. And it's that, then you should get no distractions. Yes. Okay. Um, the Housing Trust was formed uh, as a corporation in Idaho in 2009, and they hired me in April of 2014, so I am celebrating my 10th anniversary. Um, nobody's brought me a cake, but here we are. Um, it's been a, a very interesting ride as I'm coming to understand the all of the complexities of the issues of home ownership and home affordability. In fact, this morning I met with a high school student here in Moscow who is doing her senior project on affordable housing. I shared this PowerPoint with her and a few points from it. Um, and it's just interesting that young people are aware of this issue and are uh, trying to understand what the challenges are. One of the first things that I think about is the role that housing plays in wealth um, creation and in wealth storage and in wealth passing from generation to generation. Um, this one obviously came out of the Washington Post. It's, uh, it's a little bar graph of, the, of 10 deciles of uh, household wealth from the very bottom, probably my high school student or somebody just graduating from college in the bottom 10% on up to Bill Gates and other sorts of folks in the top 10% of, of wealth, household wealth. And what I see when I look at it, if you look at the leftmost one is that lowest tier of folks are holding their money as cash or as a vehicle. And you can understand that. It's like, I've got some cash and I need a vehicle to get to work. Um, and maybe a little bit in, it, it calls it primary house, right about the 50 there. Uh, it's probably some furnishings in their apartment. Cash and vehicles are kind of lousy ways to hold wealth. I mean, we know vehicles are depreciating and cash is not appreciating. Um, so as you look right across that, you see that the next group, slightly wealthier, has um, obviously total more money, but a greater percentage of it is in vehicles because they got a good car finally. Um, but they still don't have much in terms of uh, house or other investment wealth. And the next column, the third one from the left, I suspect these are people who just bought a house. All of a sudden, there's a jump in their wealth in terms of their primary house um, and less cash. Um, their vehicles are maybe nicer still, but they have more money all told. So that explains that mix. And then in the fourth column, you see what happens if you hold on to your house for a little while. My conjecture is that group has held a house for a while and all of a sudden it's appreciated, they've paid it down and they have a big chunk of wealth that they are holding in their house. So I think about wealth and housing as the way that at least we in America have organized ourselves to do some of the primary savings that many people do um, uh, for their lifetime and, and perhaps to present, to, to capture the wealth that they'll pass on to the next generation. Now I want you to think about some households. These are people that you know who are a single worker household. That may be a, a divorced person, it may be a single person, 
It may be a person who's living with some dependents, uh, either young children or living with a, a person who's older or disabled and is not working. So there's one worker in this household and there may be some dependents. And I can think of those people when I worked at WSU, they were in the workplace. I know some in the church. Uh, I know somebody in the neighborhood and certainly have friends and family. I want you to picture one or two of those people, put a name on them and think about who they are. Because we're going to talk about the implications of being a single worker household and trying to own a home. This chart is built out of data that comes from uh, HUD, Housing and Urban Development. And they have a table of... AMI, Area Median Income, and they call households that are up to 80% of Area Median Income, low income. I hate the term low income because as you're going to see, I think these are, gonna, are my friends and neighbors, and they are uh, really backbones of our community, but HUD's name for them is, is low income. I've got both Leyton and Whitman County, so you can compare. And HUD does this 80% AMI designation on a household size basis. So in Leyton County, if you're a one person household, 46,800 is the top of the 80% AMI. I'm focused on 80% AMI because there are a number of federal programs that target households that are below that. There are a number of grants that are targeted at households below that. Uh, it changes the whole economics of, of doing this work if you step above households at 80% AMI. Other thing to see in Leyton County is it's about $700 um, ahead a as you go up from one to two to three person household. Um, that's not that those people make more because they have a three person household. I think it's HUD's measure of to be apples to apples, a three person household would need 60,000, a one person household at 468. And then if you compare across to Whitman County, you see that there's a slight difference, maybe $500 between the one person in Leitaw County and the one person in Whitman County. So they've adjusted for what I think we all know, uh, the minimum wage is higher in the state of Washington. WSU probably pays a bit better than U of I. Um, and there's some other things that maybe make income and perhaps even cost of living a pinch higher in Whitman County than in Leyton County. So I'm gonna be talking about 80% AMI and I wanted you to have a picture of what that number is and think about that in terms of, I know people who make that money or people who don't make that money. An earlier version of this talk I did for the Port of Whitman. And since I think of them as a um, economic development organization, I thought they would wanna see how those uh, AMI numbers compared to some uh, currently available job postings. I pulled these back in February. You could go do the exercise again. I bet you get a similar result. Um, picking on my home city here, the city of Moscow is paying the guy who runs the sewer plant. Uh, oh, I can't quite see <laughs> because of all your smiling faces. Um, whoop, 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 whoop. That was bad. No, oh, no, no, no. There, I'll stop messing with it. I can't see the uh, the annual wage, but it's definitely in the 80% AMI if you're a, a house, I think it was a household of two. Lateral police officer, I think that's a lateral transfer position for a police officer in the city. Again, it's a job that is paying in this 80% AMI range. Uh, similarly, U of I has got a couple of positions there. Um, Whitman County had a corrections officer that they were advertising for. And, and the one that at the very bottom that I kept, City of Pullman is looking for a 911 operator. I really want them to hire that person. I want that person to stick around for a while. They are paying them just slightly, 61,000, just slightly over 
the three person low income level in Whitman County. We're gonna look and see what the implications are of that kind of a wage in terms of house buying. So that's the 68.50 is the top, the three person household in Whitman County. And this little spreadsheet is a tool that I go to regularly to think about, well, what can you buy if you earn a particular income? So at the top, there's the annual income, 60,850. The word affordable is a word I absolutely hate because everybody uses it to mean everything they want it to mean. And it's turned into a total mush of a word. The federal government defines affordable housing. Um, even they are getting a little mushy. It used to be back in the 30s when the Federal Home Administration, FHA, got created. It was 30% of your gross income is the amount you should pay on housing to be affordable. That number seems to have crept up to one third, 33%, and banks seem to have crept up to 35%. So I pick 33 to kind of sit in the middle. So of that 60,850, 33% of it expressed as a monthly is 1673. If you're paying that or less per month for your housing, that housing is affordable. And some of you are thinking, oh yeah, well, definitely mine is affordable. Um, but if you go out and look at, at rents around town, you'll see that it's quite easy. You can spend more than that on rent to get a, a three bedroom apartment. Anyway, I'm interested in home ownership. So we need to talk about taxes, roughly 10% of that 1673 and home insurance might be 5%. Um, we're going to come back to land lease and homeowners association kinds of things. Sometimes people talk about utilities as part of the cost of, of housing, but the feds don't. So I've got a zero in that role. And then PMI, that's private mortgage insurance. If you don't put down 20% when you get a mortgage, you end up paying PMI um, it's usually about 8%. And it's an insurance that since you don't have 20%, it helps insure the lender uh, with their exposure to, to your loan. So adding those up, you get a grand total of expenses of 385, which leaves you 1288 that you could be using to pay principal and interest on your mortgage. Back when I built this slide, interest of 6.5% was available. I looked yesterday getting ready for this and it was six and seven eighths. <clears throat> I've seen it go as high as 7%. Wow. Yeah. Um, and that it becomes really critical because when you take the interest rate and that payment of 1288, um, that's gonna determine what you could, how much of a 30 year mortgage you could get. In this case, it's 203,000. Um, if you bump that up a, a half a point, it'll be probably a 180 or something like that. 3% down, this buyer at that interest rate could borrow, could purchase a house that costs 210,000. Now, I think you're all aware that 210,000 won't buy a house around here. In fact, it will buy you a nice double wide in a trailer park but it won't buy much more than that. Um, the other day I was looking at lot prices in Moscow or in, in Pullman and they were hovering, it seemed like in the $100,000 a range just for the lot. In Moscow right now, there's a lot for 100,000. You wonder whether you could build on it. The $120,000 lots are clearly buildable. But that's a serious chunk of money just going into the land. And as a fraction of 210, you know, it's, it's more than half. So what we're saying is that those jobs that I showed you on the previous screen, paying below 60,000, are going to be able to buy a house that costs less than 210,000. That's all they're going to be able to. And these are good jobs. 
their, their city, their university, they're full-time, they have benefits, they have retirement, and yet those employees aren't gonna be able to afford a house. So how does a community land trust work and how can it help with this situation? What the land trust does is we hold the land in trust for the community. We separate the house in orange from the land in green and the buyer purchases just the structure and the community owns the land. And then there is a lease, it's a 99 year lease that connects the house and the land. And it's got three really important parts in it in my mind. The first is you gotta live in the house. We don't want you to turn the house into an Airbnb. We don't want you to move out and rent the house. Uh, we, want, we believe that the community wants you to live in a house that's why the community is investing in it. So that's one, live in the house. The second is you have to sell a house to another income qualified buyer. You were a HUD low income buyer when you bought in. You need to sell it be years later and those numbers will have changed, but there will still be a category of buyer who is at 80% AMI. And we want you to sell that so that it keeps in the family, if you will. And then the third is that there is a formula in the ground lease that controls the maximum sale price. And the idea is if we let the house inflate the way real estate has been inflating around here, and over the last decade, it's been about 8.5%, where wages are only going up about 2.5% a year, it'll be unaffordable. So the formula holds the inflation of the house value down. Um, it, it's sometimes called shared equity. Some of that value is, is effectively going into the land. Um, and so the resale value of the house, we hope, we believe will be affordable in the future to an equal income group coming in, income household coming in. Um, what that, that has implications and we're going to talk about it for wealth building because we think about wealth building in terms of, well, I'm going to, you know, my house is going to appreciate a bunch and I'm going to make a bunch of money on it over time. And that's the, one of the trade-offs we're going to talk about here. So the first question is how could a community land trust CLT stretch your 60,000, uh, 850 wage? And you'll see this is the same chart as before, but slightly different numbers. Taxes haven't changed, home insurance hasn't changed. There is a land lease before that was zero. That's the what we charge to connect the land and the house. Uh, we call it stewardship. Um, if you think, oh, what he's talking about sounds like a mobile home park. Well, yeah, in a little bit. A mobile home park, it's personal property, not real property. That's a difference. But more importantly, the mobile home parks around here, at least in Moscow, are charging five, six, seven hundred dollars a month in lot rent. Um, our land lease rate is seventy-five dollars a month. It's intentionally low. Somebody said to me, "Well, that's a bad invest." Looking at what we're doing, here's your sixty thousand dollar lot, and it's making seventy-five dollars a month. That's a bad investment. I go, "Yep, that's a bad investment." Unless our goal is not making money, our goal is getting people into affordable houses. Here's the other magic though. PMI went away. The way that Fannie Mae has written the rules around um, mortgage lending and community land trusts is that they will count the value of the land as part of the value in the transaction. And that can get the household to the point where their down payment plus our land equals 20% of the value of the loan, um, in which case they don't need to pay the PMI. So that increases their buying power a little bit. And what you see at the bottom, the buying power is now 219 versus 210. So we, we got another $10,000 into the picture maybe, but there's more magic. If the fee simple case, the way you and I have bought our houses, we buy the land, we own everything lock, stock and barrel. In this case, 210,000 minus the cost of the lot 
leaves 110 for the improvements. And you really can't build much of anything for 110,000 these days. In the community land trust model, where you're only buying the improvements, you're 219, we just calculated, minus zero in land costs means that the 219 can go to paying for the house, for the, for the cost of the house. Right now in Moscow, construction costs are running somewhere in the mid 200s. Um, it's, it's a shockingly big number. Before the, the pandemic, it was in the 150s range. Um, but here we are, 219 divided by the 253, you could pay for a house that was 869 square feet. I mentioned that, I focus on that, I go, oh, that's actually pretty cool. Um, a, a little detour, a couple of years ago, the College of Art and Architecture at the University of Idaho approached the Housing Trust and said, hey, we want to do a program, we want to establish a program where students design and build a small house. And these will be graduate students, they'll design during the spring, they'll build during the summer. We think we can swing the financing, except we can't afford the land. So we want to partner with you and build on your land for free. <laughs> Not free to me, but free to them. So we've struck a deal and they've built two houses and students are just getting started on house number three. And these are small houses. The current one is 24 by 36. It's a little rectangle. They're landing right in that 800, 850 square foot range. And their budgets are running in that low 200s range. I think we're actually getting to the point where students are able to design and build a house at a price that our 80% AMI buyer could actually pay for. The free land is still part of the magic trick, but it's a simpler problem to say, okay, we can get somebody and they can pay for those improvements. It's an important milestone, I think. So let's talk about how the CLT stewards the community resource. The community resource is the money that came together to purchase the land. So in this little bar chart, I've got all the money of, for this house divided into two parts, the community asset, the land, and the buyer's mortgage. And this is how it looks at the first purchase. The, we have the land, we sell the house for that other cost that the buyer is paying. Here's what it looks like five years, 10 years down the road when that buyer now is a seller. You see that the green part, the land is still there, it's the land. The mortgage, the orange has been paid down by that owner, he's owned it for a while, paid it down. And so there's a blue part, that's the part that's been paid down. And the formula is let the house appreciate some. So the house has got a higher sale price than it did. Not as high as if it were out on the free market, but it's definitely appreciated. And here comes our new buyer. Our new buyer gets a mortgage that takes out the purple, the blue, and the orange of the seller. And there's the land again, sitting at the bottom. So it's still an affordable house. Um, the, the first owner has made some appreciation and probably uses that as a down payment on their next house. But that gives you an idea of how it works and how we conserve the community's asset over time. That green goes across the bottom, the land stays out of the transaction and keeps things affordable. So um, I opened this conversation about wealth and wealth building with that chart. And the, the, the tension here is, um, against maintaining affordability. If you think about your own house, you can tell me a story. I bought it 15, 20 years ago. I paid you know, the song for it. It's now worth five times that much. Wonderful for wealth creation. But while it was affordable to you then, it wouldn't be affordable to you at that wage today, probably, because the, the value has gone up so fast. So we talk about this tension, I talk about this tension between 
wealth building and maintaining affordability. And we're gonna look at this along a spectrum. You can have more wealth building at one end of the spectrum and maintain affordability better at the other end of the spectrum. So I'm trying to get you into a house that you can afford. The first step is you're almost there. Let me give you a grant, just give you some money. Banks call this down payment assistance. They do it all the time. And they're usually in that two to $5,000 range. They help you with some of those closing costs and other things to get you across the finish line. It's great. It's great for wealth building. You own a house, fee simple. Somebody just gave you some money. Um, it's not so good down the road because if you want to do it again, and if the bank wants to do it again, they got to come up with another uh, grant to give the next home buyer. Another mechanism, this is a mechanism that we have used as the housing trust, uh, is a loan. Can't afford to give you a lot of money, but we could loan you a sil what's called a silent second. So you got a mortgage, it's as big as you can get. It's still not quite enough to buy the house. Hey, let us loan you some additional money at zero interest and zero payments. So it feels more like a mechanics lien. It just sits there and waits. When you sell the house, it gets paid back. Uh, but it bridges the gap between what you could borrow and what the house cost. It's less for wealth building because we don't give you the money. It's um, better for maintaining affordability because when that loan finally pays back, that money is available to use to help somebody else uh, with another silent second. The problem is, of course, that inflation has eaten up some of the value of that money in the process. The third station along this uh, line is the community land trust, where here the land value is pulled out and held by the community. And that value can be in the fifty dollars to $100,000 range. In fact, some of my colleagues on the west side of Washington say, oh, yeah, $250,000. We, is how much we have to pull out of the transaction in order to make the house affordable. So that value is sitting there, it's held by the community, it, it is just simply out of the transaction um, and helps maintain the, the house affordable. But the trade-off is now we're talking about a sale price controlled by a formula, so the house's value doesn't inflate as much which is why the green triangle of wealth building is getting smaller, where the blue triangle of maintaining affordability is getting bigger. That control of the sale price is, is, keeping, is reducing the wealth building and maintaining the affordability. The end of the spectrum, maximum maintaining affordability, <coughs> excuse me, is rental. You simply build a rental project, not in the private market, but uh, somehow a uh, rent controlled, publicly controlled project. You've got the best control of the price. You can decide what it should rent for um, to the next, next tenant. The problem is the cost of that is the cost of building the whole housing unit, which could be well over 100,000. So there you got a picture. We can go from grant on one end to rental on the other. <clears throat> land trust falls in the middle trying to strike a balance between wealth building for the household and maintaining affordability for the community. Uh, that's a story I have to tell you. I'd love to um, entertain some questions. Maybe I'll stop sharing so that we can see each other better. And if we need to, we can pop back in and look at another slide. So first the the, um, what do they call it? The chat. Can you put up the chat? There is nothing on the chat. Oh. Okay. Are there any questions? If not... Oh, this is, this is Mary. I have a question. Sure. And I'm not sure if it's something anybody can answer, but you know, we talk about the lack of affordable housing. How many vacancies are there? Are there is are there really a shortage of housing? Are we seeing some kind of a 
economic, uh, you know, a price bubble. Um, it, it just seems to me that the price of things has exploded, but I don't know. Are, are, there, are there truly a shortage of houses or just is it this false value? I hope that makes sense. Um, I, I guess I don't know in Pullman what the uh, vacancy rate is. Uh, there are have been all winter long and last summer relatively few houses on the Moscow market for sale. Um, I think there's a that the supply has been feeling tight. Uh, I don't know if it's going to get loosen up this spring as the season comes on. I'm going to share another screen and show you a, a, a bit of the picture here that will help answer that in another way. Um, there. This is the, this is national data from the Census Bureau. And just to help you orient, there's a kind of a gray bar in the middle. That is the Great Recession, 2008 to 2010. What this is showing you is the heavy line is the housing supply. And the shaded area is helping us think about the difference between how much is being supplied and how many households are forming, how much demand there is. And what we see is before the recession, there was actually more housing than demand. There was a surplus of, of housing. And now we're experiencing since 2010, a deficit in housing construction. Households are forming faster than housing units are being created. And here's the same basic chart for the city of Moscow. I asked the city for data on new houses being started in the city. And what you see, again, the gray bar for the recession, what you see is before the recession, we were building houses faster and it fell off, no surprise, during the recession. And we're recovering, but we still haven't recovered to our pre-recession levels of house construction. So that's not saying anything about housing formation here in, in Moscow, but at least it's giving you an idea, we're building less than we were. <clears throat> There's a question in there. Okay, there is a question from Lennis Watts. Uh, how many homes has your organization been involved in? That's a great question. Um, so we were founded in 2009. They hired me in 2014. As a working board, they did not create any homes. Um, it took me a year to get my feet on the ground, basically. And for several years, we were doing one house a year, um, equivalent to what Habitat for Humanity of the Palouse has been doing. And the first ones we did, we sold fee simple. Um, so we were over there in that grant and loan end of the wealth building spectrum because our funding source, which is HUD money that comes to the state of Idaho is managed by Idaho Housing and Finance Association. It's a program called HOME. Um, they were unwilling to let us use it for community land trust activities. They have since changed and in 2019, we built our first three um, CLT houses. Um, and now we have uh, five that are in what we, what we call in portfolio. We have five houses that are, or community land trust houses that are sold. And right now I have five under construction. So there are four being built with federal home funds and one being built by the University of Idaho. And knock on wood, um, Habitat for Humanity, Jennifer Wallace, the director there, approached me and said, hey, could we build a Habitat house on trust land? Uh, could, could we be your contractor? 
much like the U of I is my contractor or my private contractor is a contractor. And anyway, we've struck a deal between their board and my board, and they ex have been recruiting a family and expect to break ground later this summer um, to build a, a habitat house. They'll use their volunteers, they'll use their fundraising mechanisms, their family selection mechanisms, and, um, and then sell just the improvements uh, and it sits on uh, land trust land. So it'll be a sixth house in the added to the trust this year. Okay, I have, you a, have a waiting list. That's another one. Uh, another question. Do you have a waiting list? Yes. Um, we invite people who are interested in getting on a waiting list. And this is one of the, um, I'm just writing a note. Tomorrow, Jennifer Wallace and I are gonna to talk to the Moscow League of Women Voters. And what I'm proposing to her is that we have a list of things we do and we talk about them. We do the same things, but we do them differently. They go through this family selection process um, pick the family and build the house. Uh, we're more like a spec builder. We build the house and then find a family. So we do have a waiting list. Um, I use um, the realtor office, uh, Team Idaho. They're now United Country Homes, Team Idaho over here in Moscow. And my realtor is Tammy Quezada. I use her as the point of contact for would-be buyers and, and her to maintain the waiting list. Part of my strategy, we're very small and I wanna be sure that we are complying with fair housing rules. So I let Tammy carry that burden of maintaining the waiting list. Um, there, are, there are several families on it. There are not as many families as I have houses under construction. So there's definitely a chance to jump in and get a house right now. Okay, next from Patricia Grantham, who determines the eligibility for the program? Love the idea of collaborating with Habitat. Great, um, so eligibility in our terms is you have an income below 80% AMI. I try not to dig into people's personal finances. So what we have them do, is they say, I think I qualify. They tell Tammy that. Tammy says, hey, go talk to a lender. Here's a list of possible lenders, I'm but you can talk money. to any lender you want to. Uh, go talk to a lender. And I ask that the lender give me a letter that says they qualify. So they, they somebody needs to look at their income and say it meets the criteria. I try to not have my fingers in their 1040s. Okay. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Um, how much money does it, if we were to start such a thing in Pullman, how much money does it take to get started? Hmm. Or your estimate? Um. Well, a chunk of that money would be, how are you gonna staff it? Um, I'm currently a half-time staff. I am the organization. Um, and you would need, if, if you say we're gonna do it ourselves in Pullman as opposed to Moscow Affordable Housing Trust changing its name and expanding across the border, you'd need that staffing piece. Um, and then, I'm coming to understand how Washington money works. There are parallel things to my experience in Idaho where you would be able to identify um, lending sources, the federally backed lending sources. Um, you would need that because that's gonna pay for the construction of the house. Um, and you would also need a certain amount of subsidy 
um, it seems like every house we do, we end up upside down um, and we end up putting more money in on top of it, um, which could be, well, land cost plus thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars, depending on how the project goes. Um, it, it's 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 really a, a crapshoot. You start on a project, you think you know a budget, and then the Federal Reserve changes the interest rate, and all of a sudden your buyer has a different purchasing power than when you thought what you thought they did nine months ago. Um, and if you've got that ceiling of 80% AMI, you can't just say, well, I'll just find a richer buyer. You end up saying, well, I need to do something to jigger the price, insert some subsidy in order to get it down to the point where the buyer can buy it. <clears throat> so that's not a very solid dollar answer um, to you, but it is, it is not, not an inconsequential expense to decide to start a community land trust. Um, oh, here's another one. Okay, here's another one. Are your houses all on the same large piece of land or do you buy individual lots? Yeah, that's a good question. So the first three houses we did before we, we were able to use money to act as a land trust were uh, what I would call scattered site. They were located in three different places in Moscow. Two of them were um, existing houses that the elderly owner had passed away and we bought them from the estate. And they had a variety of deferred maintenance issues that we then took care of, um, replacing windows, painting a new roof, new gutters, those kinds of things. Um, and then in 20... 19, uh, yeah, 2019, we purchased a lot in Moscow that was a fairly wide lot and Moscow zoning let us divide it into three and build uh, uh, what they call a townhouse. So three houses, three houses with common walls of between two of them. Um, and so that is on um, a street called Southview. And then about the same time, we were able to buy what looks on the map like a city block. Um, we bought the land and we subdivided it and we brought in, built an alley and sewer and water and stuff. So all of a sudden I was acting like a developer and that land has 17 lots on it. Um, I'm building on five of them right now and Habitat would build on one. Um, at any rate, and we'll, we'll finish building out that little neighborhood. Um, but then it's on to finding some other land. Buying an individual lot in Moscow at $100,000 a lot is going to be prohibitive. We're going to have to find something that gets us into land at a lower price point per unit than $100,000. Do you know of any differences in the laws of Washington versus Idaho that would make it easier or harder in Pullman? Um, your tax structure is a little different um, around the sale of the property. That'll change things a little bit. An important piece is, and people sometimes ask, how does the property taxes work on a land trust house? Since it's divided into two parts, right? Land and improvements. The trust is able to go in Idaho, and I believe I've confirmed this now in Washington, as a nonprofit, go to the county commissioners and say, we would like the tax waived on this land. Um, and, and other nonprofits, churches, whatnot, you know, that's just waived on the whole thing. We said, just waive it on the land. And so the taxes being paid are being paid on the improvements only. Um, I believe that's the same in both states, in which case the we would have to pass the burden of those taxes on if they weren't being waived, uh, which if, if they weren't being waived in Washington would make the whole thing more expensive to the homeowner. Okay. 
um, sure. paying the taxes for the whole thing. But I don't think that's the case. I think that the land will be waived in either case. Idaho has a, um, a homeowner exemption to its property tax, which reduces the taxable value of your property uh, if you are the homeowner. And our land trust homeowners are able to take advantage of that. So we don't take it on the, the land, it's not being taxed. The homeowner takes it on the land, on the house itself. I don't believe the same structure exists in Washington, which will just make the taxing situation a little, a little different, a little more expensive, perhaps. Not a deal breaker. Uh, okay, a couple more. Are you a 501c3? If so, can someone donate to a household house slash land? Donate a house or land? Thank you for the offer. Uh, <laughs> yes, we are 501c3. Um, and I haven't yet resolved if we're expanding into Pullman, how that's going to happen. Do we have to create another uh, Washington-based corporation and register it also? But the intent would be that it would be a nonprofit organization. So yes, we could accept a donation of land or of, of cash, uh, conceivably even of a existing house. Uh, we'd have a conversation, are we going to turn that into a land trust house or would it make more sense to sell that house and yeah. use the proceeds to do something? Um, all of those conversations would be something that we could have. So I, I just typed in, um, if I maybe I misunderstood you, but um, Whitman County does have the ability to um, decrease property tax burden for people over 65 and they have to apply yeah. for it through the county. So that that is a possibility, at least in Whitman County. It may be in the state of Washington. I'm not positive if it's county by county or not, but we can do that in Whitman County. Great, so um, a, a 65 plus homeowner mm -hmm. can, get a, can get some tax relief. Yes, exactly. Cool. Yep. Um, we have another one. How do you decide on house size, style, amenities, et cetera? Also, Washington has an energy code that adds costs. Yeah, let's talk about the energy code first. Um, that was certainly one of the considerations that my board had in trying to understand what would be different about moving across the state line. I've talked to an architect who does residential work in Washington, and I have the idea that um, it will be an increase in cost. It won't be a dramatic one, partly because we have already have a commitment to um, energy efficiency, environmental sustainability in the buildings that we do. We put more insulation in than, than Idaho code requires. We use heat pumps. Um, and so we're trying to do things on the Idaho side because they're the right thing to do. A number of those are things that we need to do on the Washington side because of the Washington Energy Code. So it'll be somewhat more expensive was what I gathered from that conversation. It won't be dramatically more expensive. <clears throat> Uh, let's see, what was the first half of the question? How do you decide on house style, amenity, ah, et cetera? Right, house style. Um, when I started, I said, well, what should we build? And my realtor at the time was Debbie Spurgeon. And she said, three bed, two bath, two car garage. <laughs> I go, okay, uh, why? Because that's what sells. Um, I've since spent some time trying to understand demographics and was greatly helped by the city of Moscow does a household survey every couple of years, a randomly selected survey. They mail out this big packet to a household, households in the city, get a reasonable response rate, statistically useful sort of thing. The preponderance of households in Moscow, and so and they pretty well exclude the students. I get graduate students in this mix, but they're trying to mail to households. 
that are, um, well, let's say real people, um, are one and two person households. Three and four person households are not the majority of households in Moscow. Then I did a, a request of the, the county tax assessor. I, I went in, I said, I probably have to do a, a public records request. Here's what I'd like to know. I'd like to know in the Moscow zip code, about every house that you have on your records, how many square feet is it? How many bedrooms does it have? How many bathrooms does it have? The preponderance of houses in Moscow are three and four bedroom houses. So there's a mismatch between household size and number of bedrooms. And that mismatch for a, a less well-endowed household that's trying to get started, if you're having to buy three or four bedrooms in order to buy a house, you bought too much house. So we are trying to figure out how to do smaller houses. Um, the current one that the U of I students is doing is um, I believe it's 840 square feet and it's a two bedroom house. So I'm trying to understand that doesn't say that there aren't households that need three or four bedrooms, but sort of on a statistical basis, we need more small houses in our community. I suspect the same is going to be true in Pullman. And those are typically going to be um, new homeowners rather than um, people that need bigger houses. Bigger houses. I, I would think that a family starting out, a couple, is in, in the business of a smaller household or a smaller house. And then a, a child or two comes along and it's time to upgrade. Uh, which is great. Um, move from our house to the next size house and 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 move on up. You know, I I love what you just said about a smaller space because I'm you know I'm pushing my um, twilight years as as is my husband, and we have all stairs. You know, nothing but stairs. Our options for affordable housing that is you know manageable with as we age is next to nothing that we can afford here in Pullman. So, you know, I think that's a really important consideration when you talk about affordable housing for folks like us who want to stay put and still are pretty independent, but, you know, we've got these barriers with stairs, et cetera. So. Right. I understand that. And, and, I'm not sure that the housing trust is set up to meet your needs, but you have a real need. I, I speak to a number of people who are in that situation. They say, I would trade this house for a smaller one-story house. That doesn't exist. I cannot find it at any price point. Mm -hmm. And I don't understand why there are builders building into that niche because it's clear that there are there are people who would do that who would trade a house for a house um and trade down in terms of size um and they can't find the thing to do it over yeah. in pullman most recently was those barley flats condos just um up by uh helbling brothers equipment dealer where the old grain elevator was and they're spendy they're not a house um but nobody's doing a house even a small one i'm sorry to interrupt but our time is up <laughs> i'm if uh, you are willing and anybody has more questions um, those people could stay on uh, otherwise we'll close the meeting I would like to thank you very much for a very informative and interesting uh, presentation. Well, thank yes, you. Yes, great much. program. Thank you. Thank you, thank very, you much. very much. Okay, great. And I am sure some of us will be in touch with you again uh, with further questions and so on. Great. I'd, I'd love to take that on. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank Thanks you. A lot and goodbye. Okay. 
Oh, and Paul, can I get the recording? Can you give me a link to it? Did you record I, it? I recorded it and uh, will, um, I just stopped it. Yeah. Uh, but uh, 